A hundred years ago, on this day just before 9 a.m., fire alarm box 83 sounded from the Pier 6 area in the north end of the city. The crew of the Patricia, driven by Billy Wells and led by Captain William Broderick, boarded the pumper and headed to Pier 6 from the West Street Station. Hoseman, Frank Lean, Walter Hennessy, and Frank Leahy also responded. Captain Michael Maltus decided to jump on board the Patricia to replace a firefighter who had taken ill at the station and could not respond. John Duggan raced to the scene in number four hose wagon from Isleville Street Station, and John Spruan headed north from Brunswick Street Station with another horse-drawn wagon. Chief Edward Condon, accompanied by Deputy Chief William Brunt, also responded from Brunswick Street. Two ships, the Emo, a Norwegian vessel employed by the Belgian relief effort, and the Mont Blanc, a French munition ship, had collided in the harbor, and the flaming Mont Blanc was drifting into the pier. Then the unthinkable occurred at 9.05, the largest man-made detonation prior to the invention of the atomic bomb rocked the city. The explosion killed nine of the 10 members who were responding to the fire. Fate had somehow spared Billy Wells. Let us honor these nine men who lost their lives. It's an honor for us to be given the privilege of standing here in the rain to remember what happened 100 years ago. And as I said at Fort Needham Park, it is the individual stories that make history. It is the story of people like Mary Jean Hinch, who lost 10 children in the explosion, who lost her husband, who lost her mother, who lost six brothers and sisters, and yet she was found in the wreckage, pregnant, and gave birth to a son the following April and lived another 41 years. It's the Jackson family of Halifax, 65 members lost. It's the heroism of Vincent Coleman, and it is the heroism of first responders, of firefighters, who rushed in when people were rushing out, who gave their lives in the largest single loss of firefighters in the history of Canada. It's hard for us to think of that, but when we close our eyes and imagine what happened 100 years ago, we ask for the blessing of all those who were lost and the blessing of those who saved others and the blessing of those who did in fact survive and rebuilt our city. It is a story of terrible catastrophe, unimaginable catastrophe but it's also the story of courage and renewal. It's the story of resilience. And it's a story of people giving up their lives and their safety so that others may have the chance to be part of that renewal. I'm very honored to be the mayor of this city. I'm very honored on this, the 100th anniversary of such a catastrophe to recognize what happened. And I ask tonight, when you close your eyes and you ask for comfort from your creator, you cast a little thought for the people who gave so much for others. Thank you very much. Mayor Savage, distinguished guests, officers, firefighters, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today, a wet day. But I tell you what, my heart is bursting with heat. I am so proud to look at the people who've been with us today. The men and women of this great fire service, our colleagues from Boston and from south of the border, thank you for being here with us today for this important memory event and celebration of the history of this great city. Certainly, there are many types of heroes. We've heard a lot of stories about some of the heroes that lived through that terrible day a hundred years ago. 
Certainly there were those who responded to the scene of the devastation and who helped to try to stop that disaster from taking more lives. When we picture the Halifax explosion, we think of the blast and the destruction and the stories like the mayor just shared with us of the effects on families. Those who were injured and lost their lives. The people who came to this city's rescue and who helped us heal and recover and rebuild are also heroes for that story. Without them, moving past this tragedy may not have been possible. And we can certainly never thank them enough. But on that day 100 years ago, there were another group of heroes. People like Vincent Coleman, who knowingly risked their lives to save others. Think about the bravery it takes to know that your actions are probably going to lead to your death, but you go through them anyways. Today I'd like to talk about more brave souls, certainly brave souls in the history of this great organization. On December 6, 1917, our country suffered the single largest loss of firefighters in Canadian history, Canada's oldest fire department. I'm still honoured to talk about this with my colleagues from where I came from. This historical number still stands today, and I hope it's a record that will never be broken. Like all first responders, these men rushed towards the danger instead of running away. They tried to extinguish the fi fire on the pier, but no one predicted the magnitude of what was about to happen. They lost their lives, and certainly they died as heroes. It's important for us to never forget that sacrifice. The Halifax explosion may be a unique event, but the bravery still is remembered a century later. Today is an important day, but the less of these days we have in Canadian history is certainly something we strive for. On behalf of the men and women of Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency, thank you for being here today. It is certainly an honour to represent this great organization. Thank you. Mayor Savage, Chief Steubing, Boston Fire Commissioner Joseph Finn, President of the Boston Firefighters Local 718, Richie Paris, Reverend Clergy, and distinguished guests, good morning. Not only do I serve as the General Secretary Treasurer of the International Association of Firefighters, I also proudly serve on the Boston Fire Department. And I bring you greetings from the 310,000 professional firefighters throughout North America, including our General President, Harold Shaperger, our Executive Board, represented here this morning by 15th District Vice President Dave Burry, representing the Atlantic Provinces, also 3rd District Vice President, representing New England, Jay Colbert. Jay's family is what we call in Boston, two boaters. That's to say that when their family emigrated to the United States, their first stop was up here in the Atlantic provinces, right here in Halifax to be specific. My wife is a two-boater. Her family stopped here in Nova Scotia. My mother's best friend messaged me this morning when she found out that I was here in Halifax to tell me that her father was walking to school 100 years ago this morning and was blown a great distance, but survived. Halifax and Boston share so much. We're truly related. Our bonds are familial. In fact, James McLaughlin, a proud son of Halifax, designed Fenway Park. That bond even extends, I understand, to some Bruins fans from these parts. <laughs> Go Bees! 
On that fateful morning 100 years ago, when word reached the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that disaster had struck Halifax, the governor of the Commonwealth, Samuel McCall, sent a telegraph, and I quote, understand your city in danger from explosion and conflagration. Reports only fragmentary. Massachusetts ready to go to the limit and rendering every assistance. Wire immediately. Needless to say, the telegraph system was destroyed in the explosion. No return was sent. He sent a second telegraph that said, realizing that time is of the utmost importance, we have not waited for your response and have dispatched the train. On that train were doctors, nurses, supplies, led by the Commissioner of Public Safety of the Commonwealth, A.C. Rathcheski. They encountered the blizzard which struck Canada that day. And his quote was that the shovelers that had to shovel that train of assistance into Halifax worked like Trojans to clear the tracks. As word trickled back, a second train was sent. Two sheen steamships were immediately dispatched. Boston's Mayor Curley made all resources of the city of Boston, including the Boston Fire Department, available to Halifax. Our resources from the Boston Fire Department weren't needed because of the heroic stand the surviving Halifax firefighters made that ended that conflagration on the second day, saving the western end of this city. In total, 548 buildings burned. 824 had collapsed. Amongst that wreckage was little Annie Welch, 23 months old, who was saved. Her whole family lost, but lived to be in her 90s. 1,249 buildings were damaged or wrecked. 9,000 people were injured. 2,000 killed. Among those 2,000 killed were nine brave Halifax firefighters. The largest loss of life of firefighters in the history of Canada. Surviving on that first engine was Bill Welch, the driver, the chauffeur of that engine, who was blown with the steering wheel in his hands, which is displayed right here in this firehouse. Halifax shares another commonality with Boston. The Halifax Fire Department was the first in Canada. Boston's Fire Department was the first in the United States. We also share another sad commonality. That is that the nine firefighters that lost their lives here in the explosion was the largest loss of life for the Halifax Fire Department, nine members. Nine members of the Boston Fire Department died in 1972 in the Hotel Vendome collapse. Nine members, the same amount, were the greatest loss of life in the history of the Boston Fire Department. To my knowledge, only the city of Charleston, South Carolina Fire Department shares that terrible tragedy of losing nine firefighters in one incident. The people of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts stepped up, raising over $750,000 100 years ago in the relief efforts for Halifax. I know today that if tragedy befell our city in Boston, the people of Halifax would be there for us. Thank you, God bless, and God bless the Halifax Nine. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege of being part of a group of men and women who stand together. As the old expression goes, through thick and thin, I do thank you for that privilege to serve. 
It is no doubt we will continue to remember this date, and it won't be just because of the weather. It will be for the occasion in which we remember the anniversary of the Halifax explosion. It has already been stated, the lives of those who were injured, as well as those who died. And we do think particularly of those within the fire service. So it is also our privilege to remember those who bravely came to the scene, who bravely gathered and did all that was necessary and what they could, those from Halifax, those from Boston. There were brave firefighters as well as citizens of this great city. So may we remember this, yes, as a day of great tragedy, but also as a day of great honor. We gathered to remember and to honor. Keep us all in your name. Amen. The bell service that we are about to perform is one of the highest forms of tribute that we as a fire service can bestow upon a member and is usually reserved only for those who have died in the line of duty. The service today is dedicated to the nine members of the Halifax Fire Department who 100 years ago perished as a result of responding to box 83 at Pier 6 and the event now known as the Halifax Explosion. The men and women of today's fire service are confronted with a more dangerous work environment than ever before. We are forced to continually change our strategies and tactics to accomplish our tasks. Our methods may change, but our goals remain the same as they were in the past, to save lives and protect property, sometimes at a terrible cost. This is what we do. This is our chosen profession. This is the tradition of the firefighter. The fire service of today is ever changing, but steeped in traditions that in Halifax reach back 268 years. One such tradition is the sounding of a bell. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of the day's shift. Throughout the day and night, each alarm was sounded by a bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizen. And when the fire was out and the alarm had come to an end, it was the bell that signaled to all the completion of that call. When a firefighter died in the line of duty, paying the supreme sacrifice it was the mournful toll of the bell that solemnly announced a comrade's passing. We utilize these traditions as symbols which reflect honor and respect on those who have given so much and have served so well. To symbolize the devotion that these brave souls had for their duty, a special signal of three rings, three times each, represents the end of our comrades' duties and that they will be returning to quarters. And so, for those on December 6, 1917, who gave their lives selfishly for the goodness of their fellow citizens, their tasks completed, their duties well done, to our comrades, Fire Chief Edward Condon, Deputy Chief William Brunt, Captain William Broderick, Captain Michael Maltus, Hoseman John Duggan, Hoseman Walter Hennessy, Hoseman Frank Colleen, Hoseman John Spruin, and Hoseman Frank Leahy. Their last alarm, they're going home.
want to thank our invited guests, especially those who spoke here today. Thank you to our sponsors, Dignity Memorials, Law Laws, and Coastal Restorations who helped with the monument and our service today and reception. A special thank you to all of our friends from Boston who journeyed here today to help us make this a truly memorable service. Your support after the explosion and today will not be forgotten. Thank you all to all the parade participants who have stood here in the rain for, and are probably very cold right now. And finally, a thank you to the public for coming today. Your attendance is sincerely appreciated by all the firefighters gathered here today and the families of the fallen. Mr. Parade Marshal, please close the service. <laughs>